think Allah's introduction might be longer than my last <laughs> That's what I get for putting my CV up publicly available on, online. Um, yeah, so this is my last lecture. It's hard to give a last lecture when you're not dying or going anywhere because you know that sometime in the future you can give another lecture that might be a new last lecture. So this might not be what I would say if this was truly my last lecture, but I think at this point in my life, this is a reasonable last lecture for me. So, Felicia approached me and asked me if I could do this, and she said the idea was for me to uh, tell people what I would say if this were my last lecture. So if it's your last lecture, what would you tell people? Uh, she didn't say it quite like this. She said, what wisdom would you impart to people? And I'm going to question whether or not this is wisdom a little bit later on. Uh, but we'll see what I can say. This is a tough question. It's a really tough question for a number of reasons. One is that there are a lot of really interesting options. One thing I can do is pay respects to people that I greatly admire. Uh, talk about some people who have influenced me, my work, my teaching philosophy, my research, the way I handle uh, my children, or other things. Uh, I can also talk about my passions. So my daughter is in the audience, Ada. Everyone loves Ada. <laughs> when I put pictures of myself up on Facebook, I don't get many comments. But when I put pictures of Ada, I get tons. So uh, if I wanted this to be a really popular lecture, you know, I could just bring her up to the front and we could talk about all the keen stuff that she does. Uh, we can also talk maybe about secrets to having a good life. Although I'm not sure that there are any real secrets to having a good life. A lot of the things that people talk about as secrets to having a good life are fairly well known. They're just not applied all the time. Or I can do all of the above. So I'm going to try to do a bit of all of the above. In this lecture, I'm going to pay some respects to some people who have been very influential to me. Interestingly, none of the people I'm going to talk about are psychologists. They're all from other areas. Uh, I'm also going to talk about some of my passions. A big passion for me, obviously, is parenting. I'm not going to talk about that. Just the introduction is enough about it. <laughs> In my other kids. Uh, one of the things that I'm passionate about is education. I really love educating. I like helping students learn uh, in the class, outside of the class. This is something I'm passionate about. So part of my last lecture is actually going to be educationally related. And uh, we'll cover a couple secrets, if we want to call them that, too. Now, to make things clear, I don't make any claims about the originality of this. Most of what I'm presenting today is not original. It's Things, oh weird, I had something under that. It's things that I have learned from other people. So things that my mentors have passed on to me. Some of them I've sort of stumbled on by myself, but they're nothing that I think is unique that I have uncovered that no one else has. Uh, wisdom, so as I mentioned earlier, at least there said, like, what wisdom would you impart? And I'm not sure that any of this actually is wisdom either. So much of it is common sense. A lot of the talks when people give their last lectures, they're, they're common sense types of things, like spend time with your family instead of playing video games. Duh, right? <laughs> so I'm going to give you a lot of duh type information, but it, it's funny, even though a lot of this is duh, it should be obvious in common sense, a lot of stuff people forget about in their day-to-day -day practice, myself included, which has to do with the last point, which is that I am human. And by being human, this means I'm a hypocrite. <laughs> so I will say things like, oh yeah, it's a good idea generally to do this, and I don't always take my own advice. I would be so much better off if I could always take my own advice. Um, also because I'm a human, I fail all the time. So Allah said something about, um, you know, maybe I'm going to talk about my aspirations, maybe I'm going to talk about my successes, I'm going to talk a lot more about my failures and my regrets than my aspirations and successes. Most of this is about personal failures. <laughs> so for the next, I don't know how long, you guys will all serve as my own personal psychotherapists. 
Alright, before we begin and get into my failures, let's quickly go over some of the secrets of life, because some of you maybe wanted to get some of these. A lot of the secrets I talk about in my introduction to psychology class, I have the lecture uh, videos for those classes online, so if you want to learn more about those, you can jump online and check that information out. So, people, when they talk about secrets to life, they often talk about secrets to being happy and secrets to being healthy, and none of these, as I said, are really that secret. So, one of the secrets to happiness is that the things that you do are much more important in influencing your happiness than the things that you have. Some of the things that you have, you might do things with them that make you happy, but there again, it's the doing that makes you happy, not the thing that you have itself. A lot of people don't have some of the things. Before I went to America for a conference, I didn't have this little cool Android iPod type thingy, and I enjoyed playing with it. I enjoyed doing things with it, but I'm not any happier today than I was before. Because without that, I still found things to do. So the question is, what should you do? This is a big question for uh, people of a college age. What type of thing are you going to do in the future? Are you in the best major that you should be? Are you looking at uh, a career choice that fits in line with things that you enjoy? And the things that you should do are the things that you enjoy doing. It's no surprise, perhaps, that I'm a psychologist teaches a lot because, one, I love psychology, I love the science, and I really, really enjoy teaching. So if you enjoy those things, then become a PhD in psychology and, and teach as well. If not, go and design awesome computer uh, programs, or go and be a, a lawyer's advocate, or a, a house um, cleaner, or whatever it is that you find really satisfying in your own life. Another secret is to be thankful. People that are thankful for the things that they have tend to be happier than those who aren't. People that experience ups in life, if they are thankful about the ups they receive, they tend to stay up longer than the people that aren't thankful. Also, when people suffer from life's downs, people who are thankful for the good things that they still have tend to get over the downs much more quickly than those who are not. Also, don't postpone. There's some people who think like, oh, you know, when I finish college, then I can do the things that I like, then I can be happy. Okay, after graduate school, then I can be happy and do what I enjoy. Okay, after I get my job, after I get tenure. If you are postponing the things that you, that you enjoy that make you happy, you may never get to that point. So don't postpone the things that make you happy. Health, duh, be mindful of what you consume. Watch what you eat, watch what you drink. Smoking is bad, okay. If you want South Park, exercise. Uh, okay, but that's, that's all the secrets. So my first homage is to a biology teacher that I had in high school. His name was John Field. And I um, was in his class. I didn't particularly do very well in his class. <laughs> that's going to be something repeated over the next couple minutes. Uh, but he was really sort of influential. He talked to the students more like we were his peers as opposed to his subjects. So there are some teachers where they treat you like, you're the student, you're gonna learn, and I'm not gonna talk to you otherwise. But he would talk to us about his experiences in life. And he said that you really want to take advantage of the educational opportunities that you have to you. And he mentioned that one of his biggest regrets is that he failed to do this in college. So yes, he graduated from college with a um, bachelor's in biology, and he was able to get a job. But despite having been able to become a teacher in biology, he felt like he was missing something. He told me this when I was in high school. And unfortunately, this is one of my biggest regrets as well, because I didn't follow his advice. Now, there are different educational models. My personal favorite educational model is the liberal arts model. And with the liberal arts model, the goal is to produce people that are well-rounded, capable, and informed who can adapt to change in the future. Why would this be a goal? Why do we want well-rounded people? Is that really important, well-rounded? Why not just 
capable, right? So a big reason that we want people to be well-rounded is that life doesn't respect disciplinary uh, divisions. So I'm a psychologist. I know about psychological things, but a lot of the problems I face aren't psychological. They're economical, philosophical, biological. If I haven't had exposure to anything but psychology, I'm going to have a real struggle trying to deal with those other things. In democracies, where people have a choice in who their leaders are, how do you decide who you're going to elect? If you don't know about economics, how can you evaluate the economic policies? If you don't know about foreign uh, affairs, how can you judge someone's foreign policy? Right? So to the extent that you know more about different areas, you can be a better consumer of information and make better decisions for yourself. So how do you accomplish this? How do you get well-rounded people who uh, can adapt? One thing you can do is you can expose them to a lot of areas. So in the spring, I taught introduction to psychology. And I think a good 90% of my class, roughly, was psych majors. So everyone almost in my class was a psychology major. The summer, on the other hand, I have almost 90% non-psych majors. Why? Why are they taking psychology classes? Isn't that a waste of time? I mean, they're business people. Why do you bother with psychology? This is a question I asked them uh, at the beginning of the semester. And there are good reasons for them to study psychology if they're business, and for them to study sociology, and for them to study art and other things as well. What this means is that sometimes you have to take the classes that you don't want to take. I remember, I remember these. What? You mean I have to take English? <sighs> English was one of my least favorite classes because it involved lots and lots of writing. I, uh, I was very good at learning information quickly. So I like classes where we would have multiple choice tests. So I wouldn't have to study very hard. I'd just, you know, prepare before the exam, learn everything really quickly, and take the test, and that was fine. But with English, I actually had to spend time writing a lot. This is a pain in the butt. So there are different perceptions about the classes that students are forced to take. A lot of the professors that I admire think that the classes that students don't want to take present opportunities of growth for the students. By taking my psychology class as a business major, potentially you might be able to grow in some way that you couldn't otherwise. Potentially, some of the information that you learn in a class outside of the things that you're interested in could be very useful for you in your future. And even if it's not directly useful for yourself in the future, it might help you uh, take an interdisciplinary perspective in your own area. You might be able to look at your own area with a slightly different look that could give you some insight into the problems that you're facing in the classes that you're interested in. Students, on the other hand, if not all students, but Students that were like I was when I was in college took a different perspective. They thought those classes were boring. Oh, man, are you kidding me? Philosophy? Boring. Useless. Come on, what does this have to do with real life? One of my friends, a professor here at Shakir University, jokingly said to me, you know, we can just get rid of the social sciences. They, they're not useful. They don't provide anything of value. Like engineering and stuff like business, those are useful. But the social sciences, not so much. They're useless. <laughs> if something's useless, it's a waste of time, right? Oh, man. Philosophy, I want to learn about business. I want to learn about how to make deals and how to start up businesses and how to, you know, evaluate stocks. What's the P ratio? I don't know. I need to learn this stuff. So quit wasting my time with philosophy. Even more dangerous is people might perceive it as an obstacle. It's a threat. Their goal, their happiness is at the end of the education. I need to graduate. 
And these other courses that I'm not interested in, these are obstacles. I have to fight against these courses. And they don't approach these courses from a perspective where they are appreciating the opportunity. They don't perceive it as an opportunity to grow and learn. Instead, they perceive it as an opportunity to potentially fail and to not succeed. So they approach it very, very different. And this is really sad. By approaching classes like this, when I was a student, I really reduced the amount of information that I learned. There was so much that I could have learned, and there is so little that I actually did learn. Hi, I'm William. I'm a college professor. You can succeed without paying attention to all of your classes. You can succeed without following all of these rules. So I'm not saying that you can't succeed if you don't do these. What I'm trying to say is that your life can be richer and fuller, potentially, if you do. So I'm embarrassed to admit I failed philosophy. In fact, I failed philosophy twice. <laughs> it's funny, on this end of the desk, when I give students opportunities for assignments, like I know what teachers, when I was a student, were looking for. And I think, this was so easy, I should have passed this, but, but I failed it. Why did I fail it? Because it was useless. So what didn't I do? I didn't pay attention to the material. I didn't show up to lectures. I didn't, I wasn't, by not showing up to lectures, I couldn't address the written assignments like I should have. It, it's funny because I, I love philosophy now. Philosophy I find very fascinating. And I didn't figure this out until graduate school. And, you know, had I paid attention when I was actually taking philosophy the first time, or the second time, or the third time, which I, I passed, I passed the third time. <laughs> but I didn't pay enough attention to figure this out when I took it for the third time. Uh, I took four, maybe more years of French as a student. Within three years of coming to Turkey, my French was way, way, way better than it was after taking four years of French. Why? I didn't pay attention to French. French, I had to take it to get out of college. I had to take it to graduate high school on the college track. So it was an obstacle. It was something that I just had to pass to get out of. So rather than trying to learn the language, I just tried to pay the class. I focused on the wrong things, and I failed to gain familiarity with the language that a lot of people speak. Uh, I actually didn't really understand evolution very well until I got into graduate school. This is kind of scary for uh, a psychologist. I mean, you have math, and then you've got physics, and then you've got chemistry, and then you've got biology, and there's psychology. There's, it's applied biology. I don't have evolution, right? It's embarrassing. I had to take biology twice, too. I didn't fail it the first time, but I transferred to universities, and I did so poorly at it the first time, I had to retake it. Oh, finally, I got A's in classes that I don't remember taking. I've had conversations with people, and I said, you know, it's interesting, because I, I graduated with a psychology major, but I never actually took a class in personality. Well, it turns out that I did take a class in personality, and it turns out that I got an A in personality, but I don't remember anything from the class. In fact, I even have notes that I stumbled on some years ago, and I was like, well, I guess I did take this class. But I had no recollection of this, because I didn't pay attention. So what did I lose out on by not taking these classes seriously? I was a hardcore psychologist. I was interested in cognition and biological personality. That's floofy. That's useless. I don't need that. So I didn't pay attention, I missed out on things. So, what specifically did I miss out on? I'm not sure. I missed it. I don't know what I missed. The possibilities are endless, and this is seriously depressing. Had I paid attention in my four years of French, I might have absolutely 
loved French. Now I wanted to become a linguist. And in psychology, a lot of the most famous psychologists are linguists. So maybe I'd be doing much better if I paid more attention to French and gotten interested in linguistics. I don't know. Fortunately, I changed my major four times, which uh, I started as a musical theater major. I went to technical theater, and then I switched to business finance. And then I tried to get into neuroscience, but neuroscience isn't listed because they didn't accept me. They said I couldn't finish all the classes in time. But we can sort of imagine neuroscience is in there. And then finally I came to psychology. The neuroscientist said, oh, you like this brain stuff? <laughs> Go try psychology. You have enough time to finish a psychology degree, but not a neuroscience degree. Interesting, though, I took more neuroscience classes as an undergrad. I did psychology, so I totally would have met the requirements, but they didn't want to. Anyway, this means that I took a wide variety of courses that I was interested in. I took business classes because I was interested in studying business. I took theater classes because I was interested in studying theater. So this means that I paid attention to a lot of these classes. So even though I can't tell you what I lost out on by not paying attention to some of the classes that I wasn't interested in, I can tell you some things that I have gained from courses that I did pay attention to. So in theater, I learned a lot about presenting in public. I have a lot less anxiety when I have to give last lectures, for example, or TED Talks, not the real big TED online, but TED College and Ankara. Uh, so I'm okay with this. And part of the reason that I'm okay with this is because I had a lot of practice presenting in public as a theater major. I also learned a lot about how to memorize information because I was doing plays all the time. And sometimes you would join a play and you would have two weeks until it came up and you'd have to learn songs and dances and all this other stuff. And this was so awesome as a student who wasn't interested in going to some other classes because I could quickly memorize the things the night before the exam and get an A, but then not actually remember anything from the class later because I didn't pay enough attention, just enough to get it in for the day. I also learned how to project. Can you hear me in the back? Should I talk louder? I have no problem talking to a large number of people in a large room without a microphone because I, of my theater training. I also learned about performance. And I would watch teachers teach, and I would think about theater. And I would think about how this front of the classroom is really a stage, and I'm putting on a play. And if I have this idea that this is a performance in mind, then I may perform as opposed to just dole out information. And by performing, this can increase the extent that students engage themselves in my class. So I think this has helped me become a better teacher. In business, I had to take a class that exposed me to the Microsoft Office Suite. So I had to take a class, and we spent like a month on Microsoft Word, and we spent a month on PowerPoint, and a month on Access, and a month on Excel. Oh man, why should I take that class? That's dumb. As a business major, dumb. Yeah, you're going to need to use that in business. But as a theater major, why might you need to? As a psychologist, why might you need to? Well, this is on PowerPoint. Thanks to this class, I am able to do PowerPoint a whole lot easier than I could have otherwise. I have used databases to manage articles and my ideas about articles for research. Uh, I do grading with Excel. These skills that I learned preparing to be a business person have helped me become a better, more efficient teacher. Programming, interestingly, uh, when I went to the University of Illinois, they required all business students to learn how to program. So I took a class in programming for Fortran. CS majors in here might know what Fortran is. People don't use it a whole lot more anymore. A side effect of having taken this class in programming is that I got into graduate school. When I talked to my graduate advisor a couple years after I had been in the program, we were talking about the applicants and what things influenced him and what did he really like about me. And he said that the things that stuck out about my application is one, that I had programming experience. Two, I had taken calculus. 
voluntarily. I didn't have to take calculus, but having taken calculus, having gotten A's in calculus, impressed him. So this isn't something maybe that you would think, oh wow, no, as a psychologist, I'm really going to need calculus in the future. There's some psychologists who do. I'm not one of them. I don't use calculus on a day-to-day -day basis in psychology. I do use algebra and trigonometry, but, but not the calculus. But my exposure to it got me to grad school. I also took a course back when the web was new about information technology, where you had to make a website. So I made, this is embarrassing too, I made a Pamela Anderson website. She was popular at the time. <laughs> Uh, anyway, this has been really useful. So Paul uh, mentioned earlier that he was able to get information out of my website. And a lot of the things that I have on the web available to my students are based off of a foundation that I learned when I was trying to be a business student. So the take home point for this part of the talk is that value is not always apparent. You might not see value in your information technology class if you're a psychology major. You may not see the value uh, in a psychology class if you're a business major, but it might be there. And because it might be there, you should pay attention. Now, this can be difficult, especially if something is not innately interesting to you. So you can try to relate it to things that you do find interesting. Try to see if there are connections out there so you will pay more attention and be able to potentially gain that value from it later on. Don't waste your hours. Don't be like me. Don't wait until graduate school or beyond to appreciate philosophy or art or biology or even accounting. I took accounting interest to help me balance my checkbooks. Debit, credit, woohoo! All right, my last lecture's last homage is uh, an instructor that I had as an undergraduate who taught communications. And this person had such a huge impact on my life. My best friend and I, at the time, we were taking this class together, and we would talk about this professor for hours and hours outside of class. Oh, man, did you hear that? What do you think about that? Yeah, we've got to do that. He didn't teach just a class on communications. He taught a class on life and how to live. And one of the key pieces of advice that he gave to us was to check your feedback. Check your feedback. Someone tells you something, you might not like it, check out your feedback, see what they mean. Assumptions that people make are not always the truth. And because of this, you need to be careful about the assumptions that you make. This isn't just true for interpersonal relationships, this is true with science as well. Right? A logical conclusion, even if you do all the logic right, is only valid if the assumptions themselves are accurate. So, there are a lot of dangerous assumptions that people can make in day-to-day -day, um, context. Part of the reason is linguistic. Those psychological linguists. Language is inherently ambiguous. I may say something, and it could have a number of potential meanings. This is difficult. Difficult for the speaker, and also difficult for the receiver. So imagine that you have a teacher, and the teacher says, you should study more. What does this mean? It could mean a lot of things. It could mean you're really stupid, and uh, you're probably going to fail my class unless you study a whole lot more. Or it could mean that like, you're one of the best students I've ever had. You have so much potential. And if you study more and apply yourself, man, like take off, right? So which of these does a professor mean? Or, or maybe it's something different, right? There are more options besides this. So one way to figure this out is to check your feedback. What do you mean? What do you mean I should study more? Why? Why should I study more? Because you're going to fail if you don't. Aha. Uh -huh. OK, thanks, teacher. Or because I think you can do really well. Oh, OK. Totally change your um, perspective and also your interpretation of what's going on. Some caveats here is that sometimes it's hard to get honest feedback. So you ask for feedback. Why? So imagine that my wife and I were at home, 
and uh, we're eating dinner. And I'm a she's smart and better cover. And I'm eating my dinner. Everyone else is done. And she asks me, Are you going to eat any more? I can make some, you know, draw some different conclusions about what she potentially might mean. She might mean that I'm a fatty and I need to stop eating. <laughs> right? This is offensive. Or two, she might mean that, like, you know, she's going to put the food away, but she doesn't want to take it away from me if I'm still enjoying it, right? There's a good, there's a bad. How do I know? I can ask. Why? Why, honey? <laughs> what do you want to know? She wants to put it away. So she might not be honest with me. That's one possibility, right? Also, checking for feedback can be ambiguous. So I ask her, why? This is ambiguous. What do I mean? Do I mean, why are you uh, curious about whether I'm still hungry? Or does it mean like, man, you are always bothering me. Why are you nagging me so much, right? So there's an ambiguity there too. So. When I check for feedback, this act of checking for feedback can be ambiguous and lead to potential problems. Maybe they think that you're attacking me. Maybe I think that she's stupid. Come on, honey. Do I want more? Hobby <laughs> Jenna. So you should be careful when you're looking for feedback. Uh, another one of my regrets is that I didn't figure out this part earlier. That the checking for feedback can be ambiguous. My friend and I, who both took this class, it was really, we had such a bizarre sort of dynamic. Like, we would tease each other and be mean, but we'd be friendly at the same times. But sometimes we would say something so mean that, like, it wasn't clear if we were teasing or if we were, you know, really angry. So we would interrupt one another and we'd say, sorry, just checking my feedback here. <laughs> And this worked for us because we knew the rules of the game. We knew we were just checking for feedback. But other people don't always know this. So you need to be careful sometimes when you are looking for feedback. So sometimes you can't get feedback directly, so you need to cope with the ambiguity. So how do you cope with the ambiguity? Does my wife think I'm fat? Or is she just being considerate? Well, you can seek evidence directly, looking for more evidence from the same person. Maybe not by checking your feedback, but by looking for additional signs that they might have a problem or that they thought that you did something wrong. Or you can ask a third party. <laughs> Tart's a friend of mine, Tim Tart. Amy asked me why or whether I wanted more food. Do you think she thinks I'm fat? I can get evidence from him. You can tell me, yeah, she was in my office earlier today and she was complaining about how fat you were. <laughs> Ever since you went back to America, you know, you put on those five kilos and you can't get them off anymore. Anyway, while you are gathering additional evidence, one of the best ways to deal with the ambiguity is to assume the best. Assume that it is not an attack. Assume that the person has something positive in mind. And do this until you have sufficient evidence for you to believe the worst. Sometimes it is the worst. And when it is the worst, what you should try to do is be slow to defend. There's this desire that people have to like defend what they do. I do this all the time. I wrote a paper. I had a friend look at it. They gave me some critiques. I, in fact, I asked them for critiques. Here's a paper. Can you take a look at this? I'm thinking about submitting it. And we have this sort of urge, this implicit desire to defend ourselves when someone critiques us. So they were giving me really, really good criticism, but rather than listening to the criticism and trying to figure out how I could make the type of paper better, I tried to defend. Oh, well, I said it like this because of this, this, and that. Oh, well, I organized it like this because of this, this, and that. So I had failed to appreciate the valuable part of the feedback that was there because I was trying to defend myself. So the take home points for this part is that perceived attacks might not be. 
Just because someone says something and it hurts your feelings doesn't mean that they were trying to hurt your feelings. When I, uh, when I first came to Istanbul, it was 24 kilograms heavier. Someone that I met asked me how old I was, and I told him, oh, I'm, I think I was 33 or 34 at the time. I'm 30 whatever. And they're like, wow, you look so young. I'm like, thank you. And then she said, fat people usually look much older. <laughs> Thank you. 